Uh, <clears throat> I would like to welcome you to the next session of our conference. I'm Hans Schraube from Roskilde University and the moderator of this session. I'm very happy to introduce you to the keynote speaker, Hank Stamm. Hank Stamm is professor of psychology at the University of Calgary in Canada and one of the most distinguished scholars in the field of theoretical psychology. He's one of the founding members of the International Society for Theoretical Psychology, ISTP. Quite a few of the organizers, participants, and speakers of this conference are part of ISTP, including myself. And Hank was one of the founders and over many years, the editor of the journal Theory and Psychology. In his body of work, Hank developed over the past decades, um, Hank identified, commented, analyzed, and intervened in a wide range of crises within the theoretical and methodological framework of academic psychology. However, even in the most theoretical debates, it was always visible how the theoretical analysis connects with what they mean for human life, for psychological practice, and the question of justice and injustice in people's everyday life. The title of his talk is Epistemic Injustice and the Recurring Crisis of Psychology. Hank, thanks for joining in. We are looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ernst. And uh, thank you again for this invitation, which uh, has been uh, very, um, the conference thus far has been very enlightening. And I really appreciate having an opportunity to speak when um, so many conferences have been canceled this uh, year thus far. Um, unfortunately, I'm watching everything uh, almost after the fact since I'm in the west of Canada and so eight hours away from continental Europe. But nonetheless, I found the talks that I've listened to and uh, watched on YouTube very uh, enlightening, engaging, interesting, and uh, I've learned a great deal uh, thus far. So uh, it's a, a real honor to have been asked to present. And thanks for that lovely introduction, Ernst, to try to live up to it. Um, so I'm just going to uh, share my screen, which will take a second. Um, okay. Um, in this talk, uh, I want to focus on psychology and the kinds of problems raised by the current crisis, which of course is not uh, an internal crisis to psychology, but is sufficiently transforming that it also lays bare the greater shortcomings and powers that psychology enacts and represents. Uh, what's interesting is that the first thing the crisis uh, has done is create a great deal of psychological speculation that's being rushed out by psychologists and can be characterized as just as more business as usual. Um, I refer to this elsewhere as the rush to expertise based on flimsy foundations expressed in non-professional jargon and mostly common sense disguised as psychological advice. It parades in public as psychological science. New stories such as there's a looming mental health crisis. If you're working from home, mastering one mental skill will keep you happy. Pandemic straining some relationships, psychologists say. Uh, coronavirus driven stockpiling a natural but unnecessary urge, which was a, a paper, uh, comment by psychologists on toilet paper hoarding. Uh, stressed about returning to work, that's normal, says psychologists, how to heal your inner self in quarantine, and so on and so on. There's hundreds more like it, of course. 
Um, and I want to be very clear here, there are people who are afraid, anxious, depressed, and suffer from various kinds of distress that they might not have faced otherwise. Uh, and that's in addition to those who actually have, have the virus and are ill or seriously ill. So I do not want to deny those realities. And sometimes psychologists do in fact provide aid to those individuals in the form of counseling, psychotherapy, or consulting. But I'm responding to psychology's public face, its willingness to pronounce quickly and authoritatively on the latest crisis in the absence of any kind of reflective considerations, science or other knowledge foundations. Um, it's a kind of palm reading. Not that this is unusual, psychology's public pronouncements are marked by a serious lack of humility about its knowledge base. This lack of foundational certainty is in part due to another function that psychological pronouncements have, namely their role in a broader ideological landscape of contemporary life. In the neoliberal world that we currently occupy, the meandering soft science-like psychological tropes are useful reminders that we are expected to face the world individual as individuals or individually and must cope as such. No surprise there. Furthermore, psychology works very diligently to represent itself as useful and important. And of course, there are those who are busy telling us that life will be, what life will be like psychologically, that is, when the crisis subsides. One psychologist argued different sectors and industries are particularly interested to know the key signals in our collective behavior now so as to predict how we will behave in the near six to eight months and far two to five years future. From this, the idea is that it is possible to also forecast the impact on our health services, businesses, politics, and the national economy. This person then trotted out laboratory studies on reactance theory, in which it was determined based on a series of trivial laboratory tasks that when faced with restrictions on our freedom, we may feel a need to resist and fight back to regain our freedom. <clears throat> and all I can say to that is where is Jan Smedsland when we need him? For the psychologists and social scientists, these should be difficult times, since the theme of this conference, conference is the psychology of global crisis. Let me begin by saying that psychology is particularly poorly suited to evaluating this kind of crisis. There's currently a manuscript circulating on social media that has led to some rather uh, strong reactions. It's by a group of colleagues from America and Europe it is simply entitled Psychological Science is Not Yet a Crisis Ready Discipline. Using a nine point technology readiness levels checklist devised by NASA to determine, it's a checklist to determine whether a particular science is applicable to a particular problem. The authors argue that psychological scientists, their term, do not even meet the criteria to satisfy the very first level of developing usable skills. And the first level is basic principles observed and reported. Now, whether psychology should match the criteria developed by NASA for applied science is a question I won't worry about here. That's certainly arguable. But the point is simply that intervening with suggestions that may have life or death consequences cannot be made by a science that is still not sure what its fundamental objects of investigations are. As the authors of this particular paper note, in a rather great understatement, a substantial but unknown number of phenomena identified in our discipline do not operate as, consistent, as consistently as we might like to believe. I don't want to spend any more time on this. The critique of an individualist discipline that has done its part to mask the social foundations of our existence by abstracting individuals and then recontextualizing them by repudiating their social constitution is well enough known. And I sense I speak to the converted at this particular conference. Furthermore, most of our life is currently lived or is concentrated inside a manifold or labyrinth, if you will, of institutions 
Psychology deinstitutionalizes this fully and furthermore deproblematizes this social world by constituting a single social order, a personified flat notion of society. And the entire discipline makes of us all ahistorical beings whose lives have never been part of a continuous developing history, which itself is also contested. I will address some of these points uh, in a few minutes when I introduce Miranda Fricker's notion of hermeneutical injustice, uh, but I will get to that after uh, I discuss the next topic, which is necropolitics. We're subject to a form of necropolitics at the moment. See how governments must weigh the advantages of opening up their economies against the number of people who will die. In Hili Membe's sense, necropolitics is the subjugation of life to the power of death. As an expansion of Foucault's notion of biopower, which Membe saw as insufficient to account for contemporary forms of the subjugation of life to death, necropolitics attempts to account for the destruction of persons and the creations of what he called death worlds. Death worlds are those in which vast populations are subjected to conditions of life conferring on them the status of the living dead. While Membe was concerned to describe the life of, in 2003, of contemporary forms of colonialisms, warfare, death camps, and the like, that is, conditions where the lines between resistance and suicide, sacrifice and redemption, martyrdom and freedom are blurred, we can see necropolitics at work in our contemporary situation. And I think we can expand Membe's account of the state of late modern occupation and the experience of slavery through his descriptions of what it means to live under occupation. Death and freedom are irre irrevocably interwoven. Terror is a defining feature of both slave and late modern colonial regimes. He says, and I will read this, both regimes are also specific instances and experiences of unfreedom. To live under late modern occupation is to experience a permanent condition of being in pain, fortified structures, military posts, roadblocks everywhere, buildings that bring back painful memories of humiliation, interrogations, beatings, curfews that imprison hundreds of thousands in their cramped homes every night from dusk to daybreak, soldiers patrolling unlit streets frightened by their own shadows. We can think here of Palestinian territories, many people who live in war zones, the Xinjiang re-education camps, migrants on borders such as the southern US or those await awaiting deportation in ice camps, migrants on the borders of Europe. As Mele argues in such circumstances, the discipline of life and the necessities of hardship, that is trial by death, are marked by excess. What connects terror, death, and freedom is an ecstatic notion of temporality in politics. And the former governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie said on May 5th in an argument for opening up the economy, there are going to be deaths no matter what. Or when a planning commissioner in Northern California proclaimed that just as a forest fire clears dead brush, the sick, the old, the injured should be left to meet their natural course in nature during the coronavirus outbreak. Or when Trump claimed that nobody knew there would be a pandemic or epidemic of this proportion, we were witness to an insidious form of necropolitics. It's not that the plantation or the colony, it's not that of the plantation or the colony, but the topography of cruelty now derived from conditions of illness and disease, which create for us new death worlds that we have conferred on the sick, the racialized, the poor, and the elderly. That is, they have become the living dead. Membe asks, under what practical conditions is the right to kill, to allow to live, or to expose death exercised? Through forms of necropower, we have inducted these segments of our society 
into a world made possible by technologies restricted for the wealthy, the white, and the privileged, now repurposed to ensuring inequalities, not just in life, but at the moment of death. And we might ask, how is this different from the kinds of insecurities faced by millions already? War is no longer waged between armies of two sovereign states. Contemporary war is waged by armed groups acting behind the mask of the state against armed groups that have no state, that control distinct ter territories. Pembe argues both sides have as their main target civilian populations that are unarmed or are organized into militias. This is as true in Syria as it is in Libya or Xinjiang. Although Membe wrote his necropolitics long before the arrival of the current COVID-19 crisis, we are witnessing what Membe might have called or might call at this point a logic of survival against the logic of uncertainty. The survivor is the one who has stood in the face of death and is still alive. The death of the other, his or her physical presence as a corpse, makes the survivor feel unique. In the case of the current pandemic, we're witnessing what people in countries that have faced the Ebola virus have had to contend with since 1976. Families do not bury their dead in conventional ways. They must do so at a distance, wearing masks that cover their faces, standing far away, promising to have memorials later. Most cannot even comfort the dying in hospitals. This is a death without a face, a death that requires private mournings and invisible and sometimes mass burials. Meanwhile, we have leaders that steer the ship of state provide, providing cover for the rich to pile on ever more riches. Our necropolitics are not invested or concerned with individuals. In one sense, psychology has become largely irrelevant in the era of big data. It, on the, there's another sense in which it has not, but I will come to that. As Richard Poplack and Diane Neal recently showed in their documentary Influence, which they then wrote about, disinformation tools used in the 2016 election campaign and the Remain Leave campaign of breakfast, Brexit are no longer just about propaganda. Nigel Oakes, the founder of the Strategic Communications Laboratories Group, which was the parent company to Cambridge Analytica, um, was interviewed by Poplack and Neil. And their takeaway of that interview was that individual behavior doesn't matter. It's what the herd does that counts. That is the impact of 9-11 created conditions for vast amounts of surveillance and data capture in, very, in many Western democracies. Then along came Google and Facebook, as well as other players who gather what's called behavioral surplus, which is the name given to the highly valuable raw material that is captured every time we use one of their services. This is then grist for the mill of big data and can be sold to the highest bidder. It's of course the reason that social media are free. <clears throat> Excuse me. Engagement is cru crucial for selling the products of social media. As a consequence, we're no longer identified by who we think we are, gender, nationality, ethnic group, and so on, but by our consumption habits and our political sensibilities. This not only makes it possible to monitor our preferences and our habits, but to steer them. It's a new kind of influence, not a passive form of advertising, but an active form of swaying the herd to a new reality. As Lord Bell, who is the subject of this documentary indicated quite presciently, the best way to win an election is to buy it. Contemporary necropolitics are thus the politics of the herd. Those infected or dying are just so many statistics. The reason why Trump's base doesn't seem to mind if he plays golf with the death rate hitting almost 100,000 in the US. We worry about our access to healthcare, about ourselves, about our own spaces. As individuals were disposable, manipulated through what is called the rhythm media of organizations like Facebook. According to Eleanor Carmi, rhythm media refers to, to the way in which media companies temporally and spatially reorder different components in a way that orchestrates a desired rhythm, sociality, 
while filtering problematic rhythms. What Carmi calls the Facebook immune system or its anti-spam algorithm allows Facebook to develop a dynamic database, which it can use to facilitate engagement. This in turn allows it to auction ads so that it can influence people in real time. Facebook, for example, measures how long you watch a video, how much time you spend on a story relative to other content and so on. When the duration and tempo of actions are higher compared to other actions, this is an indication for a preference which can then be commodified and traded in the ad auction. We're thus subject to what Miranda Fricker called a form of hermeneutical injustice. So occurs when a gap in the collective interpretive resources puts someone at an unfair disadvantage when it comes to collective, when it comes to making sense of their social experiences. Fricker developed this as an element of her account of epistemic injustice. The latter is composed of testimonial injustice and hermeneutical injustice. I will just talk about hermeneutical injustice today, uh, and it can be easily gleaned from an example that Fricker provides. Here's her example. A woman who suffers sexual harassment prior to the time when we have this critical concept so that she cannot properly comprehend her own experience, let alone render it communicatively intelligible to others, is said to suffer hermeneutical injustice. So she argues this is a kind of injustice that stems from a gap in collective hermeneutical resources. Furthermore, this disadvantage impinges unequally on different social groups, particularly those who are hermeneutically marginalized because they participate unequally in the practices through which social meanings are generated. Whenever we are confronted in a democracy by the kind of manipulation inherent in rhythm media, we face a hermeneutic injustice. We do know that we're in fact being manipulated. We have a vague sense that something is wrong when we use social media, but we do not have the resources yet to understand and characterize what we sense and feel here. One might argue that contemporary politics runs on a kind of hermeneutical injustice. I want to return now to the question of just how psychology participates in a form of hermeneutical injustice. Fricker turned to this question because of the way in which relations of power, particularly patriarchal power, had constrained women's ability to understand their own experience. I mean that Fricker turned to the question of in hermeneutical injustice. She has uh, not addressed the question of psychology at all. Being outside forms of understanding creates a kind of hermeneutical inequality. It's the injustice of having some significant area of one's social experience obscured from collective understanding owing to persistent and wide ranging hermeneutical marginalization. What's interesting about Fricker's notion of hermeneutical injustice, at least for my purposes today, is that it's not the work of an agent. It's a structural condition. Unlike Fricker's other arm of the notion of epistemic injustice, that of testimonial injustice, the realization of hermeneutical injustice comes only when the background condition is realized in a more or less doomed attempt on the part of the subject to render an experience intelligible, either to herself or to an interlocutor. I'm particularly interested in what happens when a discipline and a professional, like a psychologist, reframes experience. On what grounds can this happen? Psychology as a relatively young discipline has wedded itself and then perfected a language that allows itself to replicate, mutate, and metamorphose quite rapidly. This is because it's a strictly functional language that can be used flexibly, but nevertheless constitutes categories of explanation. I have referred to this as indeterminate functionalism elsewhere. Think of terms such as personality disorder, cognitive deficit, passive aggressive, semantic memories, and so on and so on. 
These are vocabularies that psychologists impose on others, created to provide normative trajectories that define us and by exclusion show us what is deviant. But our theoretical categories, and these include our variables, of course, are normative and historical. What psychological discourses do once widely circulating is enable as well as restrain the possibilities of an experiential discourse. That moment we create the possibilities of a hermeneutic injustice. Um, now, I agree that far more could be said here, and I have discussed some of this in an article in 2015 on what I call the ethics of shared understanding, of where I expand on this argument, but outside the framework of Fricker's work. I only came across uh, Fricker's work more recently. By ethic of shared understanding, I mean that, psychology, that as psychologists, we trade in concepts that can have real consequences. Hence, we have a responsibility to the other for our claims. Psychologists' claims circulate in a world that has taken psychology as one science of the mind among others, guarded by professional privilege and guaranteed a stake in the educational systems and universities of the world. An ethics of shared understanding is an ethics that does not violate the norms and standards of communal existence. I grounded this in Judith Butler's notion of ethical violence or the violence we perpetrate on others when we claim to know them or demand of them a knowledge that we have defined in the first instance. For Butler, the opaqueness of the self, our inability to see ourselves clearly, bounds us to relationships with others. So as psychologists, we have a power to install or disinstall the I, the strict imposition of a psychological understanding, then is a kind of ethical violence. I want to place this in the context, and by way of conclusion, I want to place this in the context of necropolitics because psychology is not a neutral bystander. It enables the regimes of truth that make our current politics possible. Psychology is engaged with the distractions and preoccupations of an internal and unique psyche. It continues the narrative of a sovereign subject, one that struggles for autonomy. In that way, it contributes to our necropolitics, that long continuous line in modernism that has mechanized and refined our ways of death. Thank you. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hank, for your talk. Um, now we have a time for discussion. We have a good time for discussion. And um, I would like to invite uh, the listeners and participants to put your question in this uh, uh, question and answer bar on the on below on your screen just write your questions in here and then i will collect them and and uh, formulate them to hank hank this was a very interesting talk and um i i have the privilege to start with a question but what is my question i in a way i've uh, I, I was following your talk so uh the first question I had was um, when you are started, when you are saying psychology as a science is not yet ready for crisis. So, and, and that psychologists are realizing that now. In a way, isn't my, so first I have a comment and then my question. Isn't it strange that psychology, where people would expect psychologists uh, reflecting on the, per, uh, and if they, Psychologists have to work. They have to take the problems of people in their everyday life seriously and help them. What did Freud with, uh, uh, with psychoanalysis, listening to people, understanding their problems, helping to, to bring movement into the problems. So isn't it a huge surprise that the psychology is not 
uh, 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 prepared for the crisis of people today and the crisis we are confronted with. My question is, why not? Why is psychology a science not prepared for that? So after we, we are a young discipline, so but we have uh, uh, a little bit time we have had. Yeah, yeah. Well, a really good question. Uh, and if you, I, I like, I would like to think about that historically. If we look at what psychology has done in response to other crises, in other words, what, what kind of psychology do we get uh, in our various wars when psychology is asked to respond to war and the realities, uh, both personal, economic, social of war time, um, and when psychology responds to other you know, ki kinds of major social crises like 9-11, uh, one of the things we see is that psychology becomes, uh, or almost immediately becomes a kind of conservative support for, and by conservative, I mean it, it re retrenches from its, uh, what, what may have been um, a push for progressive ideals. It tends to retrench and supports the status quo. And, and we've seen this in various ways across the 20th, uh, in the beginning of the 21st centuries. Um, and I think part of that is just um, insecurity about its own status, uh, its inability to draw on solid and particularly well-formulated understandings of what it is to be a human being, uh, and uh, its uh, lack of uh, in, in its recognized lack of uh, scientific standing so when we talk about the discipline as a whole. But there are, of, of course, within the discipline, multiple very variations on what psychology is or means. So there's always a, been a critical wing of some sort in psychology's existence. Uh, and uh, there are also, you know, um, individual uh, supports for people who uh, suffer in times of crisis. I mean, I, I don't want to deny that. I don't want to say psychology is useless or that psychology should be dismantled. I mean, there, there are ways in which uh, people uh, actually recover or in some way receive some kind of benefit from uh, psychological, uh, and typically we mean here something like whatever is constituted as clinical or counseling psychology, despite all its difficulties. I mean, despite all the difficulties associated with uh, creating a so-called science of clinical psychology and uh, the controversies about empirically supported therapies and so on, despite all this, you know, that we don't want to deny that there are utilities or a kind of usefulness for psychology in certain situations, but as a field as a whole, um, it's a fairly shaggy, uh, convoluted uh, discipline, and will probably stay that way for a long time, except for the fact that it has a particular role to play in, contem in the contemporary world. That is, it, it continually advertises the message or broadcast the message, if you will, that uh, we are self-contained individuals. And, and that's an old critique, of course. Um, and by being unable to do more than categorize individuals in this way, it often misses the boat when there are serious crises. Um, you know, one of the things that's so interesting about this crisis and, and so sad in a way for the discipline is that psychologists uh, are spinning their wheels. You know, the kinds of claims that are being made, the kind of research proposals that you see psychologists making um, are not particularly helpful. They're not particularly insightful. Um, they tend to be more of the same that's just trotted out uh, to, uh, you know, presumably help uh, us understand ourselves. So I don't know if I've answered your question, Ernst, but uh, yeah, that would be that would be my uh, 
stance on that at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, more and more questions are dropping in and I would like to uh, invite uh, the listeners again to really just write your comments, your thoughts, questions, just write it into uh, uh, into this uh, question answer form and um, and I want to start um, and they are dropping in the questions. I, I, uh, I start with one uh, question from Gordana uh, Ivanovich. I have a question on ethics of shared understanding, she's writing. It is defined as not violating communal existence but who is included in communal existence or rather how can can be referred to those who are excluded uh, from community because they don't count, are expelled or have themselves distanced? Who defines community and existence? Yeah, I mean, that's a very, thank you, Gordana. Thank you for your question. That's a very good question. I mean, obviously, uh, that's a very broad uh, claim. And our communal existence is, of course, defined by where, wherever we feel part of a communal, like that we feel we are uh, included in a community. And of course, there is, and, and by way of addressing that, there are all sorts of ways in which we resist and our, uh, our various communities resist categorization uh, by professionals, whether that's psychiatry or psychology. Namely that, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, strong communities have ways of, um, uh, in a sense, uh, de-arming the kind of professional language that would define them. Um, and I see that view, or I think a good example of that, of course, are uh, religious communities, uh, various forms of spirituality that simply refuse to accept uh, what professionals define them as. Um, but also it, it makes clear that this is not a rigid one, one off. In other words, our, uh, our kind of definitions of uh, psychic life are relatively fluid. Um, but they have an influence because of the way in which psychology has been globalized. So if you look at the last, say, 50 or 60 years, psychology was a relatively uh, small discipline until after World War II, and then suddenly became a major part of university curricula over most of the world, not all of the world, but over most of the world, that is, a standardized language of individualism is now deeply embedded in various uh, languages and educational systems. So in that sense, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with a fairly uh, dominant kind of ideology that psychology can bring to the table. Um, so yes, uh, who defines community? Good question. I mean, obviously, it, uh, it's defined from within. Um, and when confronted by what is really a very uh, dominant language of individualism, uh, uh, we're often left to ponder, you, you know, what, how do I understand myself and on what grounds? Yeah. Thank you, Hank. I choose questions which maybe ref relate to the question before. So I try to make a certain order. And here's one which maybe connects from Maria Alejandro Energisi. Thank you very much for the talk. It is very interesting, the notion of hermene hermeneutic injustice to think psychology. I'm an academic woman from Chile and I was wondering that if psychology isn't ready for the crisis because historically has been a practice or science made by a very homogeneous group. So maybe it tends to reproduce the view or perspective only one group. Could you comment on that? No, yeah, good. Yes, very interesting question. Uh, yes, obviously, uh, again, I, I sort of think of that as that 
uh, focal point at the end of World War II when psychology um, became, and particularly American psychology became the vehicle with which the discipline grew. Um, it certainly was a white male enterprise and it was a white male enterprise until very much until uh, the 1960s when of course uh, universities began to open up and uh, the proportion of women attending universities and the impact of feminism gradually began to shift uh, elements of psychology. So I, uh, I appreciate that um, uh, within its roots, psychology carries this kind of historical uh, scientism, which was the outcome of a kind of uh, uh, bravado that followed World War II, the, the sort of, uh, you know, we can solve anything kind of mentality, problem of uh, a wide optimism about the possibilities of what science could do, and uh, particularly what science could do within but once applied to the social sciences. Um, and of course, uh, th that simply is to recognize that psychology is not one thing. It's a, a wide range of, as Sigmund Koch said long ago, and I think I keep quoting this particular line, Sigmund Koch said long ago, that we don't have a discipline of psychology, we have psychological studies in a wide range of them. And, uh, Psychology is also not the only game in town. There are many other disciplines that have ways of addressing what we would consider questions of mind or questions of human action. Um, and so uh, I, I certainly would acknowledge that. Yeah. Thank There's a question from Antonia Lorraine directly connected to that. Okay. He's writing, I was wondering if the idea of discipline is misleading here. Maybe psychology as such has serious limitations to act in a crisis such as this. And if it does something properly, it will tend to maintain the status quo. How about interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary perspectives? Yeah, uh, thank you, Antonio. Uh, th yeah, good point. Uh, and I, I can only agree with you. I mean, certainly uh, psychology has serious limitations, of course, uh, and uh, particularly when it's called on to address a crisis. Um, yeah, I, I would only add to that that, uh, you know, I wish psychology was much more multidisciplinary or much more willing to spread out among, you know, much more diverse views. Uh, and uh, there are, the only thing I would add here is there are strong institutional impulses that resist that, that um, having lived my entire professional life inside uh, a traditional psychology department, um, and having been on the margins of that department for pretty much my entire institutional life, um, I have come to appreciate that there are uh, huge advantages for people to remain within a fairly constrained form of a discipline. Uh, and a contemporary version of that discipline now includes the neurosciences and uh, a strong urge to address all kinds of problems in the terms of the neurosciences. Uh, and the, uh, the, I mean, it's a very simple reinforcement problem. There are large sums of money attached to being uh, a strong disciplinarian, as it were, that is remaining within the discipline. And, uh, there are also lots of rewards. And as long as the institutions continue to maintain those structures, particularly in North America, uh, I don't see things changing uh, very rapidly. But I certainly appreci appreciate the point that, uh, yes, uh, there are of course many psychologists who work across many disciplinary boundaries that, uh, and it, 
but they, you know, those are important contributions. Thanks, Hank. Now uh, I turn to uh, questions related to psychological practice. And there's um, a question from Cliff Bridgey from the US and she's writing, I do agree that there are some superfici superficial conceived provocations from psychology, but you need to take a walk outside the academia <laughs> now and again. For those of us who are experienced pra practicing clinicians, we are doing our work effectively. I might add, I might add every day. We do quite well with the crisis trauma. And many of us use a group in a community perspective. And she's continuing, the only real difference in 9-11 and COVID-19 crisis is that we are also experiencing it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I appreciate that question and thank you for the question. Uh, and uh, it's, it's why I, made very clear that I want to talk about psychology as a kind of uh, its public presentation. Um, and that, of course, there are people who are being helped and there are people who need help uh, and that there are, you know, serious mental health consequences to what has been happening. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to even begin to deny that, that that would be foolish. And I also think that, uh, um, you know, outside of the academy, uh, those are uh, the kinds of issues that are um, not not only ig ignored by the academy, but um, I wish we had an opportunity to take them up in a more serious way. Um, uh, you know, I think um, uh, we have a a strong clinical program in my department um, and it's very much um, uh, you know cognitive behavior therapy oriented um, and in that way I think it's quite limited we don't get a chance to really understand and talk in uh, more broadly conceived uh, and more interesting ways about the nature of what what it means to be confined to home what it means to uh, suffer the kinds of anxieties uh, that people have today and um, w without providing the kinds of glib answers that we seem to be seeing everywhere. So uh, I take your point. Thank you. Okay, um, we still have time and I have an overview over the questions. Yeah. Uh, but therefore, but, but because I think we have enough time, I want to drop in with a question I myself have in relation to what we are just talking. Uh, you, you are saying in your talk that um, psychology has a challenge and, and it would be a central task to render experience intelligible. So I would say many of the psychological clinicians are exactly trying to do that. So mm. when you are saying, oh, the psychology as, an, as a science we have a big problem. There's hermeneutic, uh, uh, there's ethical violence where you talk with Butler and so on. we have a problem with making experience intelligible. And you, you describe the problems we have and the hermeneutic injustice and so on. I have a question um, which, which tries to expand that. Where do you think in um, what kind of theoretical traditions in psychology or conceptualizations could help us to make experience, human experience, intelligible? Mm. Well, uh, <laughs> it's a very big question, but obviously a good one. And I think there are, within psychology, there are several tr traditions, uh, if not many traditions, where people grapple with those problems. And I think just grappling with them makes it clear uh, what the limits of the mainstream discipline are. So. The, I mean, there's a very rich history, for example, in psychoanalytic concepts going not just in Freud, of course, but moving all the way to the present, uh, all the way through Lacan and forward. Um, 
that's an enormous resource uh, for people to draw on. But there are other resources. I mean, there are the uh, what's loosely called cultural psychology today is also a very rich tradition because it draws on uh, a range of positions. Um, uh, I noticed um, Antonia, of course, asked a question then. You know her work on uh, Bakhtin and the, that particular orientation is also very rich. Um, you know there there are these strands within psychology or on the boundaries of psychology that are in fact quite capable of uh, enriching our understanding of ourselves in a way that we haven't been able to do within the mainstream. So I you know I think that's a good question. Thanks. Okay, I conti uh, continue with a question uh, of Carmen Dege. Uh, she says, thank you uh, for your fascinating talk. Could you say more about the relation you develop between necropolitics and the death worlds of the corona pandemic? Membe clearly identifies violence with human-made structures. The coronavirus seems to be different kind of beast, no? Yes, yeah. Uh, and um, as I was preparing the talk, I was thinking about this uh, because Membe's original 2003 point was simply that uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the kinds of structures that you mentioned and, and the historical constitution of those structures have created what he referred to as necropolitics. And yet here we are dealing with uh, a so-called uh, uh, natural event, quote unquote. Of course, it's not natural in the sense that um, it's the outcome of our treatment of animals and the way in which we use non-human animals for food uh, and the way in which uh, that has led to the, uh, as it were, uh, mechanization of processes associated with uh, the production of um, non-human animals for food. So we do have a kind of human-made structure here. Uh, I mean, if you look at the work of Michael Greger, uh, who in 2008 already pointed out that you know, all our flus and cold viruses originate in the animal world. Uh, and they originated in the animal world because of animal husbandry and the way in which we treat animals. So th this is, uh, these kinds of illnesses are themselves the outcome of human made structures. Okay, but then I, I grant the point that uh, the virus itself is a different kind of beast, yes. but how we respond to the virus that the royal we here that is we as countries as societies as political entities respond to the virus that's where i would see the the necropolitics at work and, and that's why i think it's relevant thanks thanks carmen for the question yeah we have a few more questions and um I take the next one from Marie-Cécile Bateau. Ah. Would you agree with viewing the communal as a note, the crucial site for activities and theorizing, because not individualistic? How do you define the communal? And second, how the sharing of understandings? Ah. Thanks, uh, Marie-Cécile. Yeah, very good uh, questions and uh, uh, good observation uh, about, you know, kind of whole in my talk uh, that, um, and, and, and really there's a whole uh, expansion here that's required. Um, and how I see this is, uh, you know, uh, a question of, um, we, we live both in uh, real, uh, that is to say, material communities, embodied communities, but we also live in uh, language communities. And uh, I think within those, there are various ways in which 
we can organize ourselves and, and consider ourselves communities. For example, we are at this point, uh, you know, participating in a kind of community that's constituted through a series of critical questions and um, yet we are uh, embodied in very different material circumstances. Uh, but when you're isolated at home uh, with your family, that's a different kind of embodied uh, kind of circumstance, even though you also share uh, a communal language, perhaps a more intimate communal language. And so uh, shared understanding here is, uh, uh, can be flexible. In other words, it depends on whose community and what kind of communities are we uh, concerned with. And uh, when psychologists impose their language on others if, uh, or suggest particular ways of understanding, I suppose that's a better way of putting it, then um, it depends on, on the language resources available to that particular community. You know, how, how well are you capable of articulating your own circumstances. So that's, that's um, where I think uh, differences between someone who's well educated and understands themselves as part of a particular world versus uh, say, for example, uh, children in school who accept whatever, or at least have before they can question it, have to come to understand the kinds of problems that are posed to them in individualistic terms. So yeah, it's a, it's a whole other topic, <laughs> but I think it's a good, uh, good question. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, Hank. Let's take a few more questions. Are sure. You yeah. More? yeah, I'm good, yeah. It's early afternoon here, so, you know. Okay. Um... I will take one from Swanima Bhargava. Um, there's a predominant narrative in India about masses of people migrating from cities back to their homes in rural India. This migration has been characterized by a puzzlement, inconvenience, invisibility in the eyes of the state. It has been challenging for the middle class and the state to understand an entitlement to community and home that this group could, cause, could possibly lay claim to. Could you please comment on the idea of the living dead and migration? Wow, yeah, that's uh, what an interesting question. Uh, I'll have to start by saying, you know, other than the news stories that I followed about this phenomenon in India, um, I have not, I, I can't speak to it. In, in other words, I, I do not know and don't have the background to address it. Uh, I, I have a superficial understanding of it. Um, but uh, the, the notion of, uh, yes, an, an entitlement to a home when you're denied from going home, even under the current conditions and, and uh, what that might mean to uh, Membe's notion of the living dead. Uh, and I, what's interesting here is that Membe's notion of the living dead is, is one he uses for people who are assigned to a kind of death uh, or a possible death or a near death. That is people whose capacity to look after themselves and live uh, are as it were at the edge. And uh, I'm not sure that applies in this case. I'm not sure that uh, the large number of people, and, and I, as I said, I can't speak to it, um, are either, uh, they're risking, of course, a great deal, but I wouldn't necessarily consider them the living dead, I think, uh, in Membe's terms. Um, it's a kind of assertion of, uh, a right uh, to return home. Um, more likely, uh, people who are living in, in horrible conditions, either on the borders of Europe or the borders of the United States, are uh, in some ways closer to what Membe meant by this notion of, you know, the migrant who is willing to risk all 
and in willing to risk all is, is as it were, catapulted into this uh, category where their life is viewed as uh, worthless by the world at large. So, but, but interesting question, yes, thank you. Okay, um, Hank, there are various comments, which I will summarize, and then we take only one more question. So, Whatever works, okay. Yeah, and, and the comments are that many people really enjoy your talk, especially also that you are addressing ethical issues relevant for psychology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, and I take now one final question uh, of Mark Freeman. Uh, mm -hmm. He's writing, thanks, Hank, really good provocative talk. So what does the discipline most need? Better psychological science? Reimagining what psychological science is and does a movement beyond science, perhaps towards the humanities? Or even more radically, is it possible that psychology has outlived itself and that something else is required? Is it possible that psychology, because of its history, simply can't do what many of us might want it to do? And that conse consequently be better off creating something new, something post-psychological? <laughs> well, that's quite a, uh, a question. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I appreciate the question. It's, uh, uh, it requires, um, again, a, a sort of uh, a distinction between what I would wish for uh, and what the, the way uh, psychology exists and, and has continued to exist in our institutions. But as Ernst was reading the question, I was thinking about the phenomena of phrenology and the way in which phrenology continued to exist in various corners of the world until the 1930s. <clears throat> and uh, in its heyday, psych uh, phrenology um, had, of course, multiple journals, uh, not to mention a vast range of practitioners who uh, seemed to make a, a very adequate living off the notion that the bumps and valleys on our skulls could tell us something about ourselves. Um, and so, uh, I, the point of that is that, you know, sometimes particular institutional forms of ex explanation can long outlive their utility um, and uh, their transformation is very slow. But <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure the, the comparison is adequate, uh, at least to answering the question, I think of course, various arms of psychology may break away and go elsewhere and do other things, such as the neurosciences, um, <clears throat> and uh, continue quite happily without ever worrying again about what the relation is between uh, the neurosciences, say, and developmental psychology or social psychology as it's currently constituted. <clears throat> so, so I think what, you know, one answer is that psychology will simply continue to fractionate um, but that wasn't really um, what you asked. That, that is, what does the discipline most need is, is uh, of course, a continual uh, reevaluation and, and a redevelopment um, towards something. Maybe it's a, a kind of humanism, uh, but I think the, the science trope is so strong within the discipline uh, and people so resist anything but that particular version of the discipline that I can't imagine it uh, ever falling away. Um, <clears throat> and perhaps we can reconstitute the notion of science in a way that's uh, um, more amenable to a broader interpretation. Uh, but I don't have a crystal ball, so I, I'm not sure what uh, what is in uh, in the future of psychology? Actually, um, I, I have to be. Uh, I have to admit that uh, I'm not a good prognosticator in this respect. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Hank. That was a wonderful talk and I really enjoyed the discussion. Um, I also want to thank the participants and the listeners. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed all these good questions. Um, and um, have in mind that the conference still continues. We already yes. have a long day, but we have one more talk uh, in around an hour from Hatem Basian. Um, thanks very much, Hank. Um, My pleasure. And thank you, Ernst, and thank you to everyone for participating. I really appreciate it. All right, take care.